assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heirs of salvation purchased of God born of His Spirit washed in His blood this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song, hallelujah, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, listen to this, perfect delight, visions of Rapture now burst from my side. I see angels. <laughs> Descending, bring from above echoes of mercy. Whispers of love. This is my story. Hallelujah. This is my song. Praising my Savior all day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission all is at rest. Here's why. I in my Savior, I'm happy and I'm blessed. Titus 2.13 I'm watching and I'm waiting. I'm looking above I'm filled with His goodness, lost in His love. Now stand up with me and stick up your hand and sing the chord. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, Lord. Hallelujah! This is my soul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad to be here tonight. I tell you, camp meetings are just like uh, going to a filling station. Praise God, if you go there to get your battery charged, you go there uh, to get some gasoline, and sometimes we come to these meetings and our batteries won't turn the starter, our starter won't turn because of the battery, and you need it charged. But I tell you, it's been charged around here tonight. Haven't you enjoyed this? Now, I remember my battery once in a while used to go, you know, and I, the starter would because of the battery. 
And I know some Christians, brother, they need a good charging tonight of the battery. And then they need to get some high tests instead of the regular. I knock on regular, don't you? I like that high test job. And uh, I believe tonight that a camp meeting is certainly that. And I appreciate the good blessings of being here at the camp meeting with Brother Sammy. And I appreciate Brother Scheitler's message. I like what he said. Of course, I, you know, he said he and Brother uh, Joe Parson were getting old. I'm glad I'm the young man with an old message. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That's what they still call me. Uh, one lady wrote me and said, Does your announcer have glasses, Brother Mays? And I said, uh, No, I don't believe it does. She said, Well, you tell him to get some because you're not the young man as you used to be every morning. But uh, I got eternal life, and so I'm going to live forever. And so praise God. If you're saved, you know the Lord, why well, you'll live forever, and what a blessing. I've been with Brother Guy Rainwater down at Eastside many years, and I was there with Brother Rainwater one year, and he had a little Presbyterian lady. Nobody else had shouted, and so bless God, she did some shouting. And she is a praising God. After the service, she came running down, and she said, Brother Mays, I'm glad to meet the young man with the old message. I said, well, bless your heart, sister, I'm glad to meet you. She said, I'm happy. I said, you are? She said, oh, she said, I'm really happy. She said, the day I'm 67 years old, I've been saved for over 50 years, and I've been hearing you preach ever since I was a little girl. Hallelujah. She said, I really am happy. Praise God. So, it's good to be here. Hallelujah. I, they call me everything just about it, but I'm glad to be here tonight and be in the service and I know you enjoyed the great message, and I believe that there'll be great messages and mornings and nights here in the camp. I appreciate Brother Sammy, but I appreciate the fine singers we had here tonight. Didn't you enjoy them? And then Brother Ed, I tell you, Brother, that just blessed my soul. I had Holy Ghost goose pimples run up my arm while he was singing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Well, take your Bibles, and I can turn to me, please. I want to read from the Word of the Lord, Acts chapter 1. Some people, you know, are living in numbers, and they count noses and noise and nickels, but I live in Acts. Praise God, I believe in doing something. Say amen right there. Amen. amen. I believe that. We need to live in uh, activity instead of this dying thing. But Acts chapter 1, if you have your Bible, I want us to begin reading. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to begin reading with verse 8 and uh, read down a few verses of Scripture. And then we're going to turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. And I want to read just a, a few verses there. If you have your Bible tonight, Acts chapter 1, and I'll begin reading with verse 8. It said, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and, and, and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now notice, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, he went away on a cloud, and I, I'm just, I just am old-fashioned enough to believe that same one's going to bring him back. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. As you see him go, so shall he come. And he's coming back. And when we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds. And that's going to be a wonderful time. Somebody asked me tonight to preach on the king is coming. I wished I could. I told Brother Sammy if I'd have felt led, I'd have brought the message, the king is coming. But uh, I, I want you to uh, hear the message tonight. I believe it's needed. We've got so much counterfeit today. We've got so many today that are substituting on one extreme and counterfeiting on the other extreme. I want you to hear. But he said, uh, he was received up out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee. Why stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as you've seen him, uh, as you've seen him go into heaven. Now notice, then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room. I want you to underscore an upper room, if you will. And he said they went up into an upper room and and said, where their abode, uh, both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and, and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and uh, Simon Zealots and uh, Judas the brother of James. And these all continued with one accord 
in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. Now, if you will, turn to the fourth chapter, and I want you to see something in the fourth chapter. I want to read two verses of Scripture here, and then I want to speak to you about a trip that most Baptists have never made. Now, I do not want to be misunderstood. I do not believe in a second work of grace or a third work of grace. I believe in 10,000 works of grace. Bless God. Somebody asked me one time, said, have you got the second? I said, I got the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. I guess the second one was good when I got it way back yonder. But there are a lot of people tonight all over this country that are afraid of the fullness of the Spirit. They're afraid of the power of God because there's so many people that have taught the charismatic view and a lot of people that are sincere and uh, they're honest people, I think, and yet they're mixed up. Now, I still believe what I believe when I first started, that bless God, after you're saved, you need to be filled, you need to be anointed, you need, brother, the power of God on you, and I believe that you need to go to Calvary, and that's the first trip. Ninety-nine percent of the people in this auditorium tonight has made that first trip. But the second trip that I'm going to preach on, not many people have made that trip. But I want you to notice with me, verse 32, chapter 4 of Acts, and it said, And the multitude of them that believe were in one heart, boy, wouldn't you like to have a church like that? With one heart and one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they all had things in common. They wasn't pulling this way and pulling that way and fussing over here and fussing over there. They were in one accord. Boy, that's a church, wouldn't you? I, I'd like to, I believe a, a pastor dropped dead if he had a church like that. He couldn't stand it. I mean, if everybody said, glory to God, we're all one accord here. And this is blessed. But let's read the next verse. It says, no, notice. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, would you notice with me, please? It says, and great grace was upon them all. Then, if you will, turn back with me to the first chapter. And I want you to notice in verse 13, it says, And when they were come in, uh, uh, in, they went up into an upper room. And when they were come down from Mount Olivet, which is a Sabbath day journey, the Bible said they went in to an upper room. Would you bow for a word of prayer before I bring you the message tonight? Father, we thank Thee for all the blessings we've already enjoyed. Lord, we thank Thee tonight that we can come and fellowship here in the camp meeting. How we thank You for this fine camp meeting. Lord, I'm so glad that You blessed it. And I pray tonight that it'll always be a place where hungry-hearted men and women, boys and girls, can come and feast off of the table of God. We thank you tonight for the good singing. We thank you tonight for the great message, my brother Scheitler. We thank you tonight, our Father, for, bro uh, for Brother Sammy and every preacher that's come. There may be a little preacher here, Lord, and he feels like putting his Bible on the shelf. There may be a little preacher here tonight, and he's discouraged and weary in well-doing. But I pray that tonight you'll charge him and supercharge him. I pray tonight for that mother, that dad, that son or daughter that's made that long trip to Calvary. But, Lord, they've never been to the upper room. I pray that tonight this message may stir and move upon every heart. God, I pray tonight that Jesus and the Holy Spirit will be made real in this service now. I pray that you'd blindfold us of the blood, give us a blackout on the world, draw our wandering minds in, that we may hear the preaching of the Word of God. And we'll praise you and we'll thank you, Lord, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, amen and amen. And the Bible said they went into the upper room. I want to speak to you tonight, ask you a question. Have you been to the upper room? I meet a lot of Christians across this country. I believe the Bible believes in Christians. I believe that they believe the Word of God. But there's a lot of Christians that know nothing about a deeper life. They know nothing about the power of the Holy Spirit. They know nothing, brother, about that upper room experience. Now may I say again, before I get into message. I do not want you to be confused. I'm not preaching a second work or a third work. And I'm preaching that after Calvary. Praise God, there's another place that you need to go. I remember many years ago as a lad, a young man down in Raleigh, North Carolina, I made a trip to Calvary. I never will forget thy faith. I came to that mountain where Jesus made atonement for the sin of the whole world. And what a blessing it was when I left that place. 
But then later, I, I heard a message that I could have power with God. And so I said, Lord, I want to make another trip. And praise God, I went from that place up to the upper room. And the Bible said, there, in that upper room. I ask you a question. Have you been to that upper room? Have you been there? That's one. Gives us a beautiful picture. Notice, it continues the work of the Lord Jesus. And Acts 1, in verse 8, it gives the promise. And he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm glad tonight there is power in the blessed Spirit of God. There's power to preach. There's power to witness. And when the church tries to substitute or do anything outside of the blessed power of God, brother, we become a failure. And then not only is there the promise in verse 8, in verse 11, there is the parting. Did you know my Lord took his disciples, went upon Mount Olivet, and praise God, the Bible said he stepped on a cloud and was taken up into heaven. You know how he went into heaven? He came into this world by a miracle of the virgin birth. He left this world by a miracle. Thank God he stepped on that cloud and went into heaven. And two men stood by in white apparel and said, Why gaze he standing looking into heaven? This same Jesus, which is he going to heaven, shall so come in like manner. And so we see the promise. Then we see the parting. And then we see the place in verse 13. It's called the upper room. Have you been to that place in your Christian life? Preacher, you'll never preach with the power of God on you until you say, I've been to the upper room. Hallelujah. Listen, Christian, you'll never enjoy the service of God until you can say, I've been to the upper room. You say, well, what is that upper room? I look back in the Scriptures. I find it's a place of three things. Before the disciples went there. First, uh, it was a place of communion. Uh, because it was in a room, if not that room, one like it. In an upper room. Uh, in Mark 14, where Jesus uh, had the last supper. Uh, and there, uh, that time of communion with Him. Uh, and then I find it's a place of comfort. Uh, it was no doubt it was in that room. Uh, when Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. Uh, and then it was a place, bless God, uh, my friend, uh, of constraining the disciples uh, to know that the resurrection was real uh, because it was no doubt in that room uh, that Jesus appeared on that first Easter uh, and they were there in fear of the Jews. Uh, but I'm glad they saw Him uh, that had been raised from the dead uh, and was in that room, uh, oh, that upper room. Uh, but here we find these disciples uh, left the Mount of Olivet uh, and they came down a Sabbath day journey uh, and they went into that room. Uh, now you say, Brother May, do we need a visit to that room? I believe we need to prove three things. These disciples proved three things. First of all, they proved to the Lord that they wanted this power. I believe if you're going to have power with God, bless God, you've got to get out to business. This playing around, man, they pay this stuff, will never get the job done. Brother, we need to mean business. We need to show the Lord that we mean business. You say, preacher, did they prove to God they meant business? They believed the Word. And for ten days they tarried and waited just like He said. I don't find any coffee breaks, any clowns or circuses coming in. Boy, they just waited for the promise of the descending of the power of the Holy Spirit. They came there with business on their minds. And when the church gets down to business, brother, we'll see something happen. When preachers get down to business, when denominations get down to business, you're going to see something happen. And you say, preacher, what they do? They prove to God. They said, we'll obey the Word. And we'll wait until the power comes. And it came as a rushing mighty wind. Woo! Praise God. I'm glad they proved that they met business with the Lord. And brother, when we get to that place where we prove that God will bless His people. You'll study the Word of God. God never blessed anybody that didn't prove that He meant business. For instance, let me show you just to three or four. Here's old Jacob. He's running. And he came and he said, you'll kill me tomorrow. And he said, but Lord, 
I want you to do something. And God sent an angel down. That angel came down, and boy, you talk about a wrestling match. I mean, they had one all night long. Oh, you say, why, preacher, who won? You know who won, but I tell you who could have won. That angel could have taken his little finger and knocked old Jacob down that hill. But when old Jacob was hanging on, that angel said, let go. And a lot of us, brother, when we could get the blessing, we're too quick to let go. I believe, bless God, you got to hang on till the blessings come. I don't believe that a sinner prays through. It's the saint that has to do the praying through. And brother Jacob, hold on. Imagine in the we are, sir. He said, let me go. And old Jacob said, I won't let you go. And I believe that angel whispered, said, hold on, son. If he wants a blessing, it'll come after a while. Just keep on holding on. And for his God, he hold on till the break of the day. And angel said, I can't be seen around here. Old Jacob said, well, you can take your choice. You either bless me or I'll keep you here for dinner, bless you. And that angel knocked his side out of joint. And brother Jacob was blessed. You say, why? because he showed the Lord that he meant business. Let me show you another. He showed the Lord he meant business. He was a bald-headed preacher. I like that. And he came to, one day he was over there and the Bible said he's crying. And Elijah threw his mantle on him. And Elisha said, Hey, what you do that for, mister? He said, if you believe that's me, then bless God, just keep on plowing. Now, but if you believe God was in this thing, said, I'll tell you, kill your oxen now, and follow me, and bless God, you'll get something. Now, a lot of us have followed, but we didn't kill the oxen. Now, if you want to be blessed, bless God, you've got to go back, now, and you've got to kill the oxen. Now, if you want to be blessed, hallelujah. You say, preacher, what happened? He went with this man for three years. You remember Gilgal, Bapha? And then one day they came down to that Jordan River. Old Elijah said, Son, I hear something rumbling up yonder. Did you know I believe the saints of God are beginning to hear a little rumble? I believe that the church knows that soon the Lord Jesus is going to split the sky. And thank God we're going to leave out of here in a shout of glory. We're going to leave here, praise the Lord. It's going to be a time. Do you know what? They started across and Elijah took that coat off and rolled it up and said, Okay, he hit the water, swam. And when he smote the water, they parted hither and thither. And God took an iron and dried that thing out and said, I don't want you to catch cold, boys. Walk over on dry ground. And praise God, they walked over on dry ground. When they got to the other side, Elijah said, Fella, I'm going to have to be going here. And I heard from heaven. And Elisha said, is that right? Elisha said, ask anything. And anything that you desire, I'll give it unto thee. And old Elisha said, I've been hanging around you. I've heard you pray. I've watched you perform miracles. I've seen God on you. And he said, there's one thing that I ask of thee before you believe me. Let a double portion of the Spirit fall on me. Woo! Praise God. I'm glad that there's a double portion of the Spirit of God that can fall upon the people of God. You say, preacher, what happened? He said, you've asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, if you see me, why go away? And so they went on. And there came a rushing, a mighty whirlwind in a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Scooped up old Elijah. He threw his mantle over to the side. Elijah walked over, picked up that mantle, <laughs> rolled it together. He said, I, I watched him. Bless God, I stayed with him till the end. I had to have a double potion. And he walked back to the river and he rolled it up and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And brother, when he spoke the waters, they parted hither. Uh, and they parted silver, uh, and Elisha walked over on dry ground. Uh, oh, he said, Brother me, uh, I'm glad, Brother, he showed that he wanted that power. Uh, and Brother, when we need to be business, uh, God will give us that power. Uh, let me show you something quickly. I believe when Elisha hit the waters and they backed up, I believe the waters up here hollered over here to the waters over there. We got rid of one, and now we got another one on our hands. Oh, it's a God. I want to tell you the power of God. 
God. Was upon him. And he met business with God. Let me show you one more. His name was Daniel. He went down to the river and he slid down. And for three solid weeks, he ate no bread. He fasted and prayed every day for his people. You remember the angel that came down and touched him and said, Beloved, whoa, should I hurt you the first day that you cried out? But I said, Oh, prince over here hindered your prayers. But said, Daniel, oh, my beloved, I've hurt you now. I believe if we're going to have power with God, brother, if you're going to have this power of the upper room, bless God, we've got to prove to the Lord that we mean business. You can't come down the aisle two and two and gun 90 miles an hour, smack and ever lick, bless God, shake the preacher's hand, go home on Sunday morning, never come back on Sunday night, never come on Wednesday night, and expect God's power to be upon you. Brother, that's got to be an earnestness and a desire, and you've got to prove to the Lord that you want this power. Hallelujah. Amen. Number two, they proved to the world they had the power. Woo! Praise God. I want to tell you, Hollywood can do a lot of things. And brother, the world can do a lot of things. But when the church gets God on it, I want to tell you, we'll march triumphant through all the hell and the blood and the battles that the world can put before us because I'm glad. Greater is he that's in you than he that's of the world. And nothing can stop us when the power of God's upon us. But, oh, we substitute this and we camouflage this and we say it won't work anymore. How you know it? You haven't tried it, hallelujah. Oh, you say, Brother Mays, they proved to the world. The Bible said, and they turned the world upside down. They didn't have a radio station. They didn't have a camp. They didn't have a TV. They didn't have an ocean liner. They didn't have an airplane. But bless God, they had the power of God on them. And they went out trying to preach. And they heard everywhere. And it turned that place upside down. Oh, it heard Jerusalem, and they said, what means of this? That's God, we never saw anything. There's something unusual around here. And brother, when we go to that upper room, brother, listen, God will bless us. Let me show you one of these disciples and show you how he proved to the world he had this power. His name was Simon Peter. And Simon Peter was, you know... I know a lot of people say, hey, he, he, he denied the Lord. Well, wait a minute, he walked on water. Don't you criticize him, but you walk as far on the water as he walks. Say amen. Up. Amen. I heard something this year. I've been going to Holy Land for 20-something years. But my guide said something this year. Mike, you was with us. You remember what he said. I, we went down to Capernaum and was down at Tiberius. And we went over to where that old city dog is there. And we were standing there. And my guide said, right over there, Brother Mays, it's Simon Peter's old house. Said, you know why Simon Peter denied the Lord? And I said, he's scared. He's a coward. He's like some of these little wishy-washy guys I know. He was afraid. He said, no, that wasn't the reason. I said, well, what was the reason? He said, Jesus healed his mother-in-law and he never forgave him. After that, and I'd never heard that. I'd heard a lot of reasons, but I'd never heard that. But I want to tell you something. Oh, Simon Peter, let him know. You say, Brother Mays, how did he let him know? Let me show you that coward, that timid man, that man, my friend, that denied the Lord in Christ. That's three things after the day of Pentecost. First, he stood up and he said, you something, bless God. When you go to that upper room, they won't have to prop you up. They won't have to scotch you up. You'll stand up, look the devil straight in the face. And brother said, and he stood up. We need some people tonight that'll stand up for Jesus. We need some people, bless God, that'll stand up for this book. And stand up for the church. And stand up for the things that are right and things that are holy. These little preachers that are afraid to stand up. It's pitiful. I never will forget Sandy said the first time you heard me preach, I preached on Jailhouse Rock. But I was a preaching that sermon over in Burlington, North Carolina. Brother Cobb at Deep Creek one time. And I'll never forget, I picked up the Burlington paper before I went to church that night. And I saw a picture of Elvis Presley. And he's all twisted that way. And I got out to church that night. And I said, I saw a picture of old E.P. in the paper. And I said, you know what he looked like to me? He looked like he swallowed a jackknife. 
and a little old girl shot out of that church over at Deep Creek and said, I'll never hear May Saxon preach. And I got the motel. She called me and said, Brother Mays. And I said, yes. She said, I didn't like what you said about Evelyn Presley. I said, I didn't ask you what I was going to say about Evelyn Presley, did I? She said, but let me tell you something. And I didn't know he'd ever sung his song. I didn't know that he'd ever, I don't know where he wrote it or not. And I said, well, lady, let me tell you something. Bless God, I don't take anything back that I said. I'm going to stand on what I said. And you know what she said? She said, you ain't nothing but a ham dog. Get hung up. <laughs> now, I didn't know that Edward Presley sang that song. But the next night, I got up to Deep Creek back to church, and I said, I may be a ham dog, but I'm barking up the right tree, honey. Praise God in the land. And the Bible. And Simon Peter stood up. We need some people, bless God, to stand up. Oh, some people that will. We need preachers, brother, that'll preach it. I've never, when I was past the church, and I don't advise you preachers to do this because you say, hey, you know, I don't advise you. Don't, don't try to be like Brother Mays or Brother Sight or anybody. You can't be that way. But I remember I said, they had a little picture that's making down out from my church called One Foot in Heaven. And I told my members, I said, if you go. So that picture will put you out of your Sunday school. We'll put you off the deacon board. I said, nobody goes to the picture show that belongs to this church and has an office. And so one of the ladies said, I'm kidding everybody in the church. I'm going. And she went. And on Sunday morning, I came in and one of the members said, did you know Miss so-and-so went? I said, I'll take care of that. Don't worry about that. And she told her, her husband said, oh, Mace won't do that to me. She said, I'll guarantee you. She said, I've got too many kids folks in this church. That's how I got through preaching. I said, folks, we've got a little business to take care of today. I said, Miss so-and-so, and I'd call her name, but somebody might know her. I said, she's sitting back there, and she went to see one foot in heaven. I want a motion that we put her out of the church. All right, we take her Sunday school class away from her, and we take her all, all of her rights of fellowship in this church until she repents. And we got to move in a second. And then I said, everybody, but uh, for this stand, her old husband stood and said, I told you, Mays, that's going to put you out of this church. Let God you to that show. And somebody said, hey, Brother Mays, uh, the Bible said, ask uh, Simon Peter had been to the upper room. He stood up. Uh, hallelujah. We need to stand up. Praise God. We need to stand up against his fidelity uh, and wickedness uh, in high places. Uh, we need preachers that stand. Second thing, not only he stood up, but he wouldn't shut up. Bless God, he had something he had to tell. Oh, when he went to that upper room, he stood up and he wouldn't shut up. Now, bless God, I want to tell you something. It'll turn your tongue loose for Jesus. If you ever make that visit to that upper room, not in something you can't understand, but it'll turn your tongue loose to praise and to preach and to pray and to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a blessing. He wouldn't shut up. Did you know what's the truth? They couldn't get him. Should have. Boy, he just kept right on. I believe, brother, when we make that trip to the upper room, we will not shut up. We'll tell the story. They brought Simon in and said, Now listen, buddy, you and that guy's making all that trouble about this resurrection. Now, fellas, let me tell you something. The issue of that day was the resurrection of Jesus. And they didn't want him to talk about the resurrection. Now, they said, Now just be quiet. Talk about the cross and talk about Calvary. But don't mention that God raised him from the dead. Uh, old Simon said, boys, I want to tell you something. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't do but what I've seen and what I've heard. Uh, I've got to tell it. Hallelujah. Uh, he said, I can't shut up. Uh, and when you really get filled, uh, uh, when you go yonder to that upper room, uh, brother, you won't shut up. Uh, you'll tell it wherever you go. Uh, you'll be a witness for the Lord Jesus. Uh, and then number three, they couldn't lock him up and keep him locked up. Bless God. I want to tell you, after you'd been to the upper room, they'd throw him in, but God would get him out. And all you'd say, Brother Mays. They came to Simon Peter. And they put him in there in Acts 12 and put a sword dripping with blood over his head. And he said, Oh boy, I cut James. I'm going to cut your head off. And he said, And of course, he, God gave him a tranquilizer and he went to sleep. And while he's sleeping, God sent an angel down because it said over there at the church, prayer was made without ceasing. They didn't have enough money to bail him out, but they had enough faith to pray him out. Praise God. Oh, the upper room. Brother, they had enough faith to pray him out of jail. You say, Brother Mays, what happened? Watch this. And an angel came, and a light shined in. Hallelujah. Boy, that's a great day when the light shines in. Glory to God. 
And then that angel smote him on the side. Sometimes God has to give you appendicitis before you'll ever think about the God. But he smote him on the side and the chains fell off. And the angel said, pick up your garment, son, we're going to take a trip. Oh, he followed that angel to the first ward and the second ward. And when they came to the big iron gate... Simon Peter said, excuse me, angel, I'll open it. But he didn't have to. God had some Holy Ghost springs on that thing. And he just opened it its own accord. And brother, they went out into the city. And Simon went down and said, the Lord hath delivered us out of the prison. You say, brother, man. I mean, uh, here are the disciples. They proved to God uh, that they wanted this power. Uh, number two, uh, they proved to the world that uh, they had this power. And number three, they proved to themselves uh, it was worth the cost. Uh, but every cost them for this power. Uh, I want you to know tonight it comes high. It, there's persecution. Uh, some of your own family look down their noses at you. Uh, some of the people that you think love you so good. Uh, you go to that upper room, brother, uh, and shout a little uh, and praise God a little. They'll look at you. Uh, I want to tell you something. Bless God. I'm like Dr. Sire. Uh, I was born in this crowd. Uh, I've had a good time with this crowd. Uh, I'm going to heaven with this crowd. Uh, I'm going to shout, brother, Matt, with this crowd uh, while the angels roll on. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, preacher. I'm glad that willing to pay the price. Prisons didn't bother them. Oh, persecutions, uh, they didn't bother them. Let me show you three. And then I'll close the message. Oh, they knew that they proved that they, it was worth everything to pay the price. Number one, Paul the Apostle proved it was worth everything to have the power of God upon his life. Uh, because when he was writing that last letter, he came down and knocked on the cell and said, Buddy, we got the chopping block ready. <laughs> Old Paul said, can you wait a minute? I'm writing the last letter that I'm ever going to write. I'm going to tell that young preacher to keep on preaching uh, that I've come to the end of the way. Uh, I'm going to tell him, bless God, there's a crown of honor. I see it right now. Uh, waiting on me and not to me only, but all those that love his appearing. Uh, and Paul the apostle said, I've fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Uh, I finished my course. Uh, and beloved, he knew that when he came down to die, uh, oh, if he laid his head on that old chopping block, uh, I hear him say, Hallelujah! I'm glad God was with me, and God's still with me. And brother, it's wonderful tonight to know that whatever the cost is, you go to Calvary, but if you go to that upper room, it'll cost you. It may cost you a lot of criticism. It'll cost you maybe, and you'll be ostracized from your friends. But it's worth it to be alone with Jesus. Have God on you and walk. Oh, it's a blessing. I preached last night on the fire. It burns like fire. My fourth point or fifth point was, when you walk with the Lord, it burns like fire. The Word of God burns like fire. The wooing of sin burns like fire. But I got down to that fifth point and I said, the walk with the Lord burns like fire. After the resurrection, two disciples started down. The little priest called him is. Their hearts were heavy, but they met a stranger on the way, and that stranger said, Hey, fellas, uh, let me quote you some of that Old Testament. Uh, and he got to quoting about the prophets, uh, and the Bible said, One of them said, Honey, I got a heartburn over here. Uh, it's beginning to burn when we draw nigh to God uh, and we score close to Him. Uh, brother, our hearts will burn with us uh, when we fellowship and walk with God. What a blessing it is. Now, watch this tonight. Paul, he proved it. Secondly, there in the Bible was Stephen. I had a friend, he's a Nazarene. I know some of you Baptists frown on him, but they're, they're good, some good Nazarenes. I had a good friend named G.T. Spear of the old Spear family, good friend of mine. He used to say to me, Brother Mays, you're sanctified and don't know it. And I said, you you got eternal life and don't know it. Praise God. Said, Amen. I said, that's right. That's right. If you're saved, you've got eternal life. He used, to, he used to sing for me, and I appreciate him. He'd get on his feet, his, he'd get back on his heels, and old dad speared, look up, that white hair, glistering. He'd sing, I'm bound for that city. <laughs> and if he ever really got up on those heels still, I mean, God would plug him in, and you talk about him getting juicy around there. <laughs> oh, listen, God would squeeze your heart and juice and run out your eyes. He'd get so foggy, you'd take a seeing our dog to get you home. You've never been in this thing like that. And brother, when God spear, would get to singing. And he used to tell me, he said, Maze, 
How do you feel when you stand where Stephen stood? He said, let, let me sing that for you. And old dad's fear gets to singing, I see Jesus. And he gets to singing about Stephen, a hero coming home. So the next time I went to the Holy Land, I went over to Stephen's gate, and I said, how far out here was it where Stephen was stoned? And the man said, about 35 steps. So I walked out there. I don't know whether that's right or not. You know, they'll tell you most anything. So I walked out there and I stood and I said, Lord, I don't know whether this is the exact spot or not. But I said, there's a deacon full of faith and power and the Holy Ghost one day. And that deacon, bless God, stood up. And he wouldn't compromise. And he is filled with the Holy Ghost. And because he said, you're like your daddies. And you're stiff-necked and proud. And resist the power of the Holy Ghost. They stoned him and knocked him with their teeth. But he looked up and said, I see Jesus. Woo! Good old dad spear said, May he said, Did you see him? I said, No, sir. But I stood in the same spot where Stephen stood. And I said, Oh, there's where Jesus stood up at the right hand of the Father and said, A hero's coming home. And I imagine old Stephen said, that The bites and the blood and the rocks are not hurting so bad. Bless God, I suffered through this. And oh, he said, It's worth everything to know the power of God is upon you, Mr. And he mentioned the third one. Now, I never understood this until I read Josephus. And maybe you don't believe in Josephus, but I like to read the works of Josephus. The old Simon Peter in the last chapter, John chapter 21, the Bible said out there on that seashore, Jesus fixed them something to eat, and he said, Simon, you love me? And he kept on, and then he said, Simon, follow me. And Simon, he, he said, Simon, will you follow me? He said, Simon, when you as a young man, you put on your, you gird your cloak. And you went anywhere you pleased when you was a young fella. But said, Simon, I want to tell you something. When you get old, you're not even going to gird you. Somebody else will put your coat on you. They'll bind your hands. And blow the one out your hands. And you'll glorify me in your death. And the old Josephus said, they put Simon Peter in prison. He became an old man, his back bent, his hair white. And they'd come by and say, hey, fisherman! And he'd say, don't call me a fisherman. I quit that one day on the Sea of Galilee. And I thought of Jesus, the Son of God. I denounced him one time, but fellas, I want to tell you something. Bless God, I'll never denounce him again. He's mine and I'm his. And he said, you know, I'll never deny him again. And they sent a message down, Josephus said. And said, Simon Peter, it's time to die. And Simon Peter came out. And Josephus said he stood before the emperor. And the emperor said, I'll tell you what you're going to do, son. You're going to do just what you did over that cave. You're going to do just what you did over there that bush that night. You're going to deny him, or I'm going to kill you. And he said, you know what I'm going to do with you, Simon? I'm going to slap a coat on you. And so he slapped it on him. He said, stick out your hands. And Simon said, I knew that. And they put those, he said, something like steel around his wrist. And they tightened it tightly. And he said, now, I'm going to crucify you. I'm going to take you out and crucify you, but one more time, if you'll deny the Lord, you won't have to die like that, Simon Peter. And old Simon Peter, according to Josephus, said, wait a minute, sir, will you take these things off of my wrist? And he said, sure. Take them off! And the centurion of the souls of the guard took them off. And Simon Peter said, no, I won't deny my Jesus. I won't deny him now. I've been with him too long. I've had his presence and his power on me. He said, Sir, you're going to crucify me. But don't call me the big fisherman. He said, After you crucify me, tell him a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to die before he denied the Lord again. And the old Josephus said, The emperor said, Turn him upside. He said, That's the way he wanted it. I tell you, I'm not worthy to die straight up. Turn me upside down. And tomorrow when they come to the public auction of uh, this place of execution, uh, and they look up here on the hill, and they see my head down, and my feet up, uh, and the blood that's dripped out of my veins, uh, said they won't call me the fisherman then. Said they'll walk by and say, there he is. His name was Simon Peter. It means a stone. His name was Simon, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? He knew he paid. Oh, he proved himself to have God's power. He was worth it all. Let me give you this to my clothes. I used to go to Jamaica. In fact, I've been 11 times. But it was a joy years ago to go to Jamaica. I'd go and 
enjoy the people there. And I liked them because they liked me. And I'd preach and they'd stand for an hour. And then I'd get through preaching that hard. Preach again, Brother Mays! And I'd say, I preached everything I know. They'd say, preach that same thing. I'd say, all right, praise God. And I'd start again, hallelujah. And preach and they'd listen. And boy, they enjoyed it. And they, they were sweet people. And you know, there's always, uh, there's badness because they want you to give them something. Now, a church in Pennsylvania gives me my watches. This is a great watch. It's a wonderful watch. And, uh, 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 I could go on, but down there, they'll ask you for something. And if they ask you for your watch, you just have to give it to them. But they all like my red Bible. I've carried a red Bible longer than any preacher that I know of. Before Billy Graham, Bob Harrington, or any of them, J.D. Scott, many years ago in Greenville, South Carolina, Gave me a red Bible after he got his assurance of salvation. Twenty-eight years ago, I started carrying a red Bible. If you've been in my meetings, I've never carried anything for 28 years but a red Bible. And I had a new one just like this that a fellow gave me the other day down in Jamaica. And a little girl had come to hear me every night, and everybody had to stand. There wasn't any seats. And she's crippled, and she dragged her foot and come to that meeting. And at that time, Jamaica was under the the domain of the uh, English government. Uh, they were under the rulership of Great Britain. And they worked hard for just a meager fire. In fact, that little girl worked all week for a shilling. And at that time, a shilling was 15 cents. And I didn't want to forget. I got through preaching. Night after night, she'd come up dragging that little foot and say, Hi, Brother Mason. I said, Hi, how are you doing? She said, Fine. I like that. She said, You know, I break rock all day. And she said, I'm 10 years old. And she said, Brother Mays, I come to hear you. I walk about two miles every night and go back every night to hear you preach. And said, Brother Mays, I love you now. I, I want you to know that I'm a Christian. And I'd say to that little Jamaican girl, fine, God bless you. Appreciate that. And the next day or so, I was out in the Jeep. And we went back over from Kingston or Montico Bay or Spanish Town. Or if you've ever been there, you know, it's back over there in the inland near the, uh, the, the caves and we, we pulled up the little old store there, and I got out of the Jeep, and I heard something like this. And I said, uh-oh, what is that? The missionary said, that's a wolf. I said, a wolf? He said, yes, they come out once a year. They pounce on maybe a young calf or a kid or a child. And said, the wolf's right. And I said, well, excuse me, I'll get back up the Jeep. I didn't want anything in that store anyway. He said, Brother Mays, they won't attack them until night. I said, yeah, but it'd be my luck to get a colorblind one, and I ain't taking no chances. I asked him, he said, brother, man, you. And I said, I don't want them wolves after me. And I got in the car, and I went in. So, Saturday night came, Sunday night came. I got through preaching, and I was telling all the folks goodbye. We was having the best time shouting. And that little girl standing over there, and I said, hey, how are you, dear? She said, fine, brother, man. She said, I want to give you something. I said, oh, you do? I said, I thought you'd want something. My Bible? Uh, uh, my watch? She said, no, I don't want your Bible. I want you to keep it. It's a beautiful Bible. And I said, thank you. She said, I want your watch. I said, thank you. I said, what do you want? She said, I want to give you something, Brother Mays. And I said, do you? Well, I'd appreciate it. I, I really would. I, I've had a lot of wonderful gifts given to me. And I'd appreciate it, dear. And the tears ran down the little black cheeks. And she looked up and said, I worked all week for this shilling. And I want you to have it, Brother Mays. And I want you to take it back and pray for me, because every day till God takes me to heaven, a little old crippled ten-year-old girl is going to step off and get on her knees and pray for you, Brother Me. And I'd like you to pray for me. And I said, oh, well, that'd be good. Just give me the shilling then. And I said, no, I don't want it. I, I wouldn't have it. I'll tell you what to do. I'll pray for you. But I said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. And I said, is there anything that I can give you? And she said, one thing. And I said, what's that? She said, why are you so preaching tonight? I've never had this to happen any other meeting, any other time, any other place. She said, why are you so preaching? I saw the Spirit of God come down on me. And she said, I looked. And I said, oh, Lord, I don't want Brother Mason's Bible. I don't Brother Mason's watch. I don't want anything you have. But I want the Spirit of God to come on me like the Spirit came on him while he's so preaching you. And boy, I stood there and it squalled. I mean, I cried and the tears dripped down and fell on that old dirt floor. And I said, I, I don't know what to say. I, I really don't know what to say. She said, uh, I'll kneel. But before I kneel, I'm going to show you something. I said, what? She said, call the missionary over here. And she had a picture. She pulled open her side and the side was ripped open right here. The little 10-year-old girl said, I want to see, see that. She said, you know, Brother Mays, 
When I was eight years old, I walked in the church one night, and the wolves were out just like they are tonight. And I had to pack the wolves and said, I came on the church, and I was going home, and I said, pack. And he said, you know, Brother Mays, they tore my side open, and two men drove them away. He said, we don't have any hospitals except down in Kingston, Jamaica. It was too far, Brother Mays. And so they took me home, and Mama prayed. And then Mama took a needle and some thread and showed me up, Brother Mays. But said, you know, the Lord helped Mama do that. And the Lord touched me. And she said, the reason I'm telling you that, said, I got two miles to walk over the hill tonight. And I heard the wolves there. I said, yeah, I, I heard them yesterday. She said, well, if you'll pray for me, and the Spirit will come on me. I ain't afraid of them wolves. I'm not afraid of any wolves. And I didn't know what to do. And I've never done this before. I've never done it before. never done it since. That little crippled girl fell down in front of me and... I laid my hands on that little girl and I said, Holy Spirit, breathe on her. Holy Spirit, breathe on her. And when I got through praying, she looked up and she said, Brother Mays, did you see him? He's all over me. Brother Mays, you know, the Spirit of God is on me. And then she kissed my hand. And I said, every day till I die, I'll pray for you, Brother Mays. And I said, God bless you. And I saw her start out that old tabernacle. This is the way she walked. She dragged that little foot. And as she dragged that little foot, I said to the missionary, let me follow her. He said, okay. I followed her. Have you ever been to Jamaica? Palm trees, banana trees, coconut trees. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I pulled outside that tabernacle. She's just starting up the hill. And over the hill, I heard something like this. And I thought the wolves were out. And she must have known I was looking. Because she turned around on that little crippled foot and she said, Brother Mays, don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit told me that they can't bother me anymore. I'll see you, Brother Mays. And you know, I saw that little crippled girl drag that leg over the hill. And down the road she went. And I came back in that little tabernacle and laid down the dust on the floor where there wasn't anything but dirt. I raised my hand to the heaven and I said, God, I'm so glad the Spirit is Oh, it's worth everything to go to the upper room and know that the Spirit of God can rest upon you. Have you been to the upper room? It's worth everything. Have you felt the Holy Ghost? And the power of the Spirit of God is worth everything. Go to the upper room. You may be persecuted. You may be excommunicated. You may be scandalized of the world. But you can raise that hand toward heaven and know that He, the blessed Spirit of God, will be with you and bless you and reign with you. Oh, Lamb, come. I ask you, have you been to the upper room? Would you bow your head for a word? They proved to the Lord that they wanted this power. They proved to the world. They had this fire. They proved to themselves that it was worth it, whatever the cost, to have the power of God on it. Friends, you may sing, you may preach, you may teach, you may be great, but without Him resting upon your ministry of your life, without the power of God, your sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Oh, how blessed it is tonight to want to go to that upper room, to want to come to this camp meeting.